Good day, everyone. It's lovely to see you here again for another visit and another adventure in art. Today, we're going to be talking about Frida Kahlo, the Mexican artist whose fame has outshone her husband, Diego Rivera. Uh, when she was alive, it was just the opposite. Diego Rivera was far more famous than she. She has uh, outpaced him since. So let's start with our discussion of Frida Kahlo. Of Frida Kahlo, this is the first self-portrait she did after her accident. She did this for her fiancé at the time, Alejandro Arias. We see the influence of Modigliani in the, in the, the, the extremely long neck and the attenuated, uh, stretched out hands. Uh, now, Arias left for Europe after the, after the accident, which left her crippled. But her letters to him are poignant, begging for him to return and visit her. He may have been put off by her pleadings and her strong, unpredictable personality. He also knew of her two affairs, a lesbian affair and an affair with her father's lithograph, lithograph lithographer friend. She was the third of four daughters, and she had two half-sisters, her father having been married before. And in the age of six, she got polio in her right leg. Her father was a Hungarian Jew and a photographer, an amateur painter and an intellectual. She was very, very close to her father. He taught her photography and the love of books, and they went together on forays for photos, and she always looked back on these times with great happiness. She was a brilliant student, always with a book, on her, book in her hand. She read Schiller and Goethe, and she went to the Prepa National Preparatory School uh, for hoping to be a doctor. But at the age of 16, there was an accident. She was on her way home in a bus. The bus was struck by a tram. A railing broke loose, and the railing entered her body. And, cr and the, the metal rod went right through her and exited her body, ex entered through her pubic area. She also had 11 breaks in her right leg because the right leg had been, and the, and the foot of the right leg had been crushed totally. Arius carried her out off the bus after a bystander pulled the rod out of her, which was the worst thing you can do. Uh, whenever and something like that enters your body, it automatically seals any bleeding. For example, a, a pin, let's say a staple in your hand. The, it automatically s s seals the blood. But when the, but when the rod was pulled out, it did terrible damage to her body. And it was said that she spent her life dying. Now, this is the next picture of Frida and Diego Rivera from 1931. This was done a year, after, uh, ap a year or so after their marriage in 1929. He was 42, she was 22. The family assented to the marriage despite the fact that he was a fat, ugly communist. But they realized she needs someone to take care of her. The family had huge medical expenses and the parents were, the father was not well, he was an epileptic. So Rivera paid off the family, paid off the family house and allowed the parents to live in the house. So you can see the, the very shy way she holds his hand. Now he, she portrays him as an artist. She doesn't portray herself as an artist though. She looks much, she was much tinier than he was. He was a very, very big, bearish man. She was much smaller than he was, but she portrays him as an artist, even though she is painting, but does not portray herself here as an artist. Now, um, this painting here, my grandparents, my, my parents and I, uh, this is the, Metropo the Museum of Modern Art in New York, done in 1936. Callow's 
paintings are all rooted in her Mexican heritage. And this you have to understand in order to understand her works. You also have to understand that she went, underwent something like 32 operations in her life, trying to repair the leg, the foot, her back, uh, and, and other things. So she, she lived in pain. And as I said, she, she spent her life dying. Now, um, here she is in the courtyard of the place where she lived, which was called the Casa Azul, the Blue House. And behind her sits her parents on their wedding day, where she is pictured in her mother's womb. The grandparents are above, and they are joined, everything is joined together by the ribbon she holds as a small child. We see a typical Mexican landscape, and it reflects the continuity of life. Now, there is a dreamlike quality to this, which we will see in many of her works. And this was shown at the very first New York exhibition she had in 1938, which we will discuss uh, at greater at length in a little while. Here is her husband, Diego Rivera, a renowned artist, a communist, a serial adulterer, an overeater, and an egotist. Not a good combination for, that makes for an ideal husband, such as in Oscar Wilde's play, and which has been uh, done into a movie, by the way. If it ever go, is on um, TCM, Turner Classic Movies, you should watch it, okay? Now... When you add Frida's violent, volatile temperament, then you have an incendiary situation. She was his third wife. He continued womanizing, including an affair with her younger sister, Christina. After the, the, um, the affair with Christina, when she found out about it, she divorced him in 1940, but they remarried in the same year. In other words, they couldn't live without each other and they couldn't live with each other. He did only one portrait of her, but she did numerous, numerous portraits of him. She once said of him, why do I call him my Diego? He never was nor ever will be mine. He belongs to himself. In other words, again, the ever, ever, ever present egotist. Now here is a picture of her sister Christina from 1928. She was the younger sister and they were extremely close. She had two children, which Frida adored. By the way, Frida had very, very strong maternal instincts, but she was never able to have a child because of what had happened to her on that bus. We will discuss that later, okay? Her affair with Diego was the final straw that led to their divorce. The early works are portraits of the family and family, friends, and herself. She was also, she also immersed herself in art history books to learn as much as possible during her convalescence. When she was in the body cast after the accident, she was in the cast for more than a year. So her father, in order to entertain her, brought her a lot of books. And he also brought her a painting set. So, and he set up an easel so that when, even when she was lying down in bed, she could do some painting never realizing that this was, she was actually developing an art, a, a, a talent that she never even knew she had because her initial ambition, of course, was to be a doctor. Now, in 1931, this is her portrait of Luther Burbank. In 1930, now remember they had married already, Diego was invited to San Francisco to do a mural for the California Stock Exchange a strange assignment for an avowed communist and an enemy of capitalism. They stayed in California for about six months, and elements of Frida's mature style began to coalesce. Burbank here emerges from the earth, his lower body a trunk, a tree trunk, rooted in the soil, and below the, and the roots are in, infesting a skeleton. Now, we are going to see in many of her paintings roots, root, that you are rooted to the soil from which you come. Now here, Luther Burbank is hybridizing a plant. His efforts are seen in the trees behind him. The wispy clouds also appear very frequently in her works. This was at the, her first exhibition in New York in 1938, by the way. Now here is another one called The Self-Portrait Between Mexico and the U.S., done in 1932. They are, at this time, 
Diego Rivera is in Detroit painting murals for the Detroit Institute of Arts, which are still there, by the way. You can still go to Detroit and see these murals. There were a number of them, and believe it or not, they were financed by none other than Henry Ford. So in other words, they, they employed another communist uh, and a, an avowed enemy of capitalism to come and uh, do, the, do the paintings. So they were, they were in Detroit for about a year and a half or two years while he did this. She stands here on a plinth with, um, the, with uh, on the bottom of the plinth, it says Carmen Rivera. And to the left, you will see a Mayan pyramid and pre-Columbian art. And at the very bottom, the ever-present rooted flowers, which refer to her Mexican roots. Now, on the left-hand side, you see the sun. And on the right-hand side, you see the moon. She believed that dualities were part of the workings of the world. She had no feelings of ambivalence despite her uh, rather dressy, dressy clothing. Now, this is 1932. That really is an, uh, that dress really is based upon Mexican clothes because in, 19, in the 1930s, women's clothing was very, very slim, very, very chic. They used a lot of uh, silk and satin and the dresses were very clingy, almost what we would call today a slip dress. Now, the, f the flag she holds, a flag, and she, but she turns toward Mexico showing where her heart is. The U.S. is represented by Ford Motors, and the flag is enveloped by the smokestack and automatons and industrialization, which refer to her times in the U.S. and the recognition she received here as well. Now, while she was in... Um, Detroit. She had a miscarriage. The next picture I will warn you is rather gruesome, okay? This is called Henry Ford Hospital. Free to desire children. She really loved them. But the accident damaged her reproductive organs and she lost her second child in Detroit. This graphic picture shows the baby in utero. A snail refers to the slow horror of losing a child. The orchid was a gift from Diego while she was in the hospital, but it may also refer to fertility. And the machine shows the impersonality of the medicine and the, the pelvic, the, you see the destroying of the pelvic area there, referring to the injury she sustained. Uh, and you can see too, the bed appears to be almost floating in the clouds, all right? She painted herself this way many times, helpless in a bed absolutely helpless and the forces the forces of nature were determining her life so to speak she wrote of her work this was also in the 1938 new york exhibit she wrote in her work quote i never painted dreams i paint my own reality her work is as you can see intensely personal and all reflects upon her life now, while she was in Detroit, she went shopping one day. She wanted to buy some sheet metal to paint on. Rather than using canvas, she was going to use some sheet metal. So she went out with a friend, Lucian Block, and they're walking down the street, and she sees this store window in a very poor neighborhood. Frida took to this display of disparate, unrelated items with a picture of George Washington and a paper flower garland in, 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 encompassing it. She was fascinated because it reminded her of Mexican folk art. So Diego suggested, well, why don't you paint it? In the background, she adds an oil derrick, a small smokestack, and a tiny framed U.S. map. If you look above the horse's head, you'll see those little figures there. Frida's imagination was very freewheeling. She could become fascinated with the simplest of things that others might dismiss, dismiss as junk. In fact, she collected a lot of junk. She collected a lot of figurines and she had those Mexican paper flowers and she had a plethora of junk all over the house. And recently there was an exhibit of the things she had and as a matter of fact, they even had some of her bottles of nail polish there, okay? So let's go on to the next. The next one is called My Dress Hangs There, meaning the United States. This is done in 1933 and they are still in Detroit, okay? Frida is homesick for Mexico and she paints a rather caustic portrait of the U.S. as she sees it. 
the column on the left holds a toilet, indicative of our preoccupation with sanitation. The, the church behind it has a cross, which is entwined with a dollar sign, again, showing our penchant for going to church on Sunday, but also worrying about the almighty dollar. The crowded skyscrapers, the industrialization, and the overflowing trash can also indicate what she thought of America. And there is Mae West on the left. If you look on the left behind, behind the toilet, there is Mae West in all her glory as a cultural icon of the 30s that reveal her distaste for crowds and her homesickness. The dress is there, but you notice Frida is not because mentally she is back in Mexico because they were in the U.S basically from 1930 to 33, because don't forget they were in California, and then he was invited. And these murals uh, made him world famous. He made a lot of money. He had a lot of girlfriends. He ate a lot and he drank a lot. So he must have had an, and a lot of grocery bills and liquor bills because he weighed at one point close to 350 pounds. So now getting into 1934, 1934 was a bad year. 1933, of course, uh, she, lost, she lost the child. And I'm sorry, in 1932, she lost the child. In 1934, Diego had numerous health concerns, including depression. Frida had three operations during this period in America. The first was an appendectomy. Then there was another, a third abortion that had to be performed on her and another foot operation because the, the right foot was turning inward. So she had problems with the, with the right leg and her, and her um, foot for most of her life. That is the reason why she adopted, one of the reasons anyway, she adopted Mexican dress. She always wore Mexican type clothing. He, um, Diego liked her to dress that way, uh, but it also, um, and of course it also, she identified with Mexico, okay? She didn't identify with wearing slinky satin slip dresses, okay? And, and a, a, a fur coat or a, or a, or a mink stole. Um, she, her, her, her entire being was rooted in Mexico. And the Mexican clothes, because the skirts are longer and fuller, they could hide her leg, they could even hide the foot. She limped, and I know at one point she did use, she did use a cane toward the, ed toward the end of her life. So anyway, um, things are very, very difficult for them. Now the next one is from 1937. Now you, okay, 1937, me and my doll. She collected dolls, figurines, as I told you, a lot of um, dust, what my mother would call dust collectors. I'm sure your mother called them dust collectors as well. And a menagerie of animals, parrots, monkeys, and even a little baby deer, a fawn that she adopted because she had a strong maternal instinct and she lavished love on these creatures uh, and on her niece and nephew because her sister Christina had two children, okay? Um, here is a very unembellished setting. She sits on, on, the, on a bed and there is a naked doll beside her as she stares at us with cross arms holding a cigarette. By the way, she also was a drinker, smoked as well, which was, that was common in those days. Smoking in the 1930s was considered, if you were a woman, it was considered very, very sophisticated, okay? There is no interaction here with the doll. It refers to her thwarted desires to have a child. Now, in the same year, they were back in Mexico, and um, Leon Trotsky, who was a communist from Russia, as you know, had fled Russia and came to Mexico seeking asylum there. Uh, he was later assassinated, as you know, because uh, the Trot there was there was a, a faction in Russia called the Trotskyites, and by destroying Trotsky, they basically destroyed the Trotskyites. All right, they, because the uh, uh, the hardliners in Russia had taken over. The hardliners, with of course Joseph Stalin and his and his cohorts, had taken over. Now here, when Trotsky came she had an affair with Trotsky as well. 
This, call, this is called the self-portrait to Leon Trotsky, and it was, she was going to give it to him as a gift. Now, um, Kahlo poses herself as if on a stage, wearing again a Mexican peasant costume, and notice that the curtains are parted and there she sits. The patterns and the color of her dress suggest Mexican folk art. She did many self-portraits emph emphasizing a, a hypnotic stare between her jet black eyebrows with actually met across her, the bridge of her nose, but she never really plucked them. She left them that way because they kind of created like a, when she would paint her, her self-portraits, she kind of created like almost a heart-shaped with the eyebrows, okay? The beginning of a heart shape. Now, the painting, this painting can be called primitive. Why do I call it primitive? First of all, it's very flat. It does not, none of her paintings really give you a sense of aerial perspective. There, there is one or two that I will show you that have a sense of perspective, but generally speaking, they're very, very flat. And, and the, the figures themselves are, shall we say, not modeled with light and shadow as a Renaissance artist would do. They are extremely flat, okay? But then again, this is part of the, the Mexican, uh, 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 pr the primitive art of Mexico. The color contrast, the flatness, and the decorative qualities all point to the influence of Mexican folk art. Now, she was briefly the lover of Trotsky, perhaps getting back at Rivera for his womanizing. This also was in the 1938 exhibit in New York City. Now, the next one here, Memory the Heart. This is done in 1937. Now, here we get a little sense of space, all right? Because she is there, and there is an arrow through her body. And behind that, there are two other images. The rod pierces her heart and joins the three images together. This was after she discovered the affair of Diego and Christina, okay? The cupids, the cupids are on, there were two cupids on the rod, and they are seesawing, which of course cause, causes great pain. In other words, the, the, Diego was seesawing between her and her sister Christina. The dress is a school dress, and it is contemporary, all right? It's contemporary, Frida. Uh, and the Mexican dress, the Mexican dress, well, that's what, that's what Diego liked, but she dresses herself there in a, in a contemporary dress. Her hair is short. As a matter of fact, I believe she, after the affair, she cut her hair off and it was short. He preferred it long, however. Now there was also in the figure, you'll notice an absence of hands, again, indicating her helplessness. The greater her despair, the bloodier her paintings were. The re there is also, has, was also another operation on the foot. If you look at her right foot, you will see a little bandage that looks almost like a sailboat. She's wearing flat shoes, and, and so, in other words, she had had another operation on that foot as well. Now, interestingly enough, in 1938, one year after she was doing all these paintings, she had never sold one, okay? She had an exhibition in 1938. But in that same year, Edward G. Robinson visited Diego. He came to Mex in Mexico and visited Diego in Mexico. And he, Diego showed him Frida's works. He had some there in the studio. And Edward G. Robinson, as you know, who was the, act, the Hollywood actor who, uh, who played um, uh, in uh, all the gangster movies in the 30s with George Raft and whatnot, and he always, he always played a gangster or a mobster or a killer. And, um, but he was very, very, uh, he was a very cultured man. In real life, he was extremely cultured, collected impressionist works, uh, also appeared, I know, on the $64,000 question, answering questions on art. Now, he, he saw Frida's works, and he purchased four of them for $200 a piece, a total of $800, which in the 1930s, I'm sure, would have probably been a nice deposit on a small house, because housing houses went for three or $4,000, or maybe $5,000. That would have been a deposit 
basically on a house, or it would have bought you it would have bought you an automobile. That's for sure, because um, the or, the or, uh, uh, a Ford automobile. That's for sure it would have bought. Now, Frida was overjoyed at suddenly making her own money, and she emerges in her own right as an artist, and said, "I I can actually make money." In other words, she didn't need Diego to survive, even though she did need him to survive, if you know what I mean. There's a, there was a duality there. Now, and even implies to um, the sculptor, Isamu, the Japanese sculptor, Isamu Noguchi, that she is thinking of leaving Diego. Now, in 1938, in November of that year, she has her first exhibit in New York City at the Julian Levy Gallery. It was an exhibition of 25 works, which included this one and a few, a few others that I've shown you as well and mentioned that it was at the ex exhibition. It was attended by Georgia O'Keeffe, who was, of course, an Alfred Steiglitz, whom, who was her husband. And, of course, she had been living in New York and was very, very much part of the New York art scene, shall we say. And also... Uh, John Sloan, another one of the artists of the, of the um, uh, Ashcan School, and also Alfred Barr, who was the head of the M Museum of Modern Art in New York. He was the director of, he was the first director, by the way, of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Andre Breton, the, the, the surrealist writer, wrote the catalog introduction, calling her a self-created surrealist. Frida denied this, saying, quote, I do not consider myself to be a surrealist. I do not know if my paintings are surrealist or not, but I do know they are the frankest expression of myself. I detest surrealism. To me, it is, seems to be a decadent manifestation of bourgeois art. So it just goes to show you that she was a little bit pink. Diego was a red, but she was a little bit pink as well. Surrealism is an art of the unconscious. Frida, however, was totally aware of her physical and psychic pain. Now, I'm going to sh introduce you to someone else who was very influential in <coughs> Frida's life. This is Nicholas Muray, of his portrait of himself with Frida. Murray was born in Seged, Hungary. He was a Hungarian. So there, right there, there was a connection because her father was Hungarian. I don't know if she knew any, Hungar any of the Hungarian language. That I do not know because her father basically had, had lived in Germany. Uh, there are many ethnic Hungarians who live in Germany and many ethnic Germans who also live in Hungary, okay? Now, um, uh, Murray was born in Seged, Hungary. Seged, Hungary is the capital, or shall we say, the, yes, the capital of the paprika industry, okay? He came to the U.S. in 1913 at the age of 21 uh, with $25 in his pocket. He was a celeb became a celebrity photographer who worked for Harper's Bazaar and Vanity Fair when Claire Booth Luce was the editor there. He was also an Olympic fencer, and fenced in the Olympics in 1928 and 1932. He was energetic, charming, kind, and sophisticated. Wednesday evenings, people would gather in his studio, all the intelligentsia, Eugene O'Neill, the, the, um, the writer, Martha Graham, the, dance, uh, the dancer, Gloria Vanderbilt Whitney, who would establish the Whitney Museum of American Art, and Jean Cocteau, the writer. They started an affair in Mexico in 1931 after his divorce from his second wife and shortly after her marriage to Rivera. So she was carrying on with him for almost 10 years. It was an on and off relationship that did last until 1941. He married his third wife during their affair as well. Her letters reek with passion and love for this man who photographed her works for the 1938 exhibition in New York helped in the packing and shipping of the works, and advised also on the catalog. She, he was really invaluable to her. He was a very, very, uh, not only a, a talented man, but also a very, very uh, helpful person. Now, she re, he reminded her of her father. In fact, she also had borrowed $400 from him, and she tells him she will return it when she sees him. He was to die of a heart attack in 1965 while fencing. 
They met each other through another artist named Miguel Covorubias, who was an artist and caricaturist also for Vanity Fair. Now, he did photos for Vanity Fair, and so, and Miguel Covorubias did uh, caricatures, and I'm going to show you one of his caricatures. If you can ever find any Vanity Fairs from the 1930s or 1940s, um, they are really fabulous because it, it, it was always a very, very uh, of-the-moment magazine, but they employed the best photographers, and they still do employ the best photographers. And also, Miguel Covorubias to do caricatures. Now, this is one of his caricatures right here. Clark Gable and Edward, the, Edward Prince of Wales, meeting on the, um, uh, on the, on a um, golf course. This is an improbable meeting of the elegant future king and the king of Hollywood. By this time, he had done his, the movie with Claudette Colbert. Uh, it had happened one night. He was working with Gene Harlow. Gone with the Wind would come four years, four years beyond this, okay? Now, Gable was a man's man, swearing, drinking, and hunting. He abstra she abstracts Gable's face, almost making it into a Picasso flattening it, uh, skewing the, the features, emphasizing the lips, okay, and um, make it, making his ears look jug-like. They meet at a country club lawn party, perfect setting for the POW, that is the Prince of Wales, who is wearing one of his famous plaid suits, but totally incongruous for Clark Gable. He wouldn't know what to do with a golf club, okay? Covorubius' ca caricatures are not to be missed, as I said. In, you'll find them in old copies of Vanity Fair. I wish I had an old copy of Vanity Fair. But part of the, and by the way, Covorubias was a friend for life. He was part of her honor guard at her funeral. Now, let's go back for a minute. So this is how she met Nicholas Murray. Obviously, they were, Murray and Covorubias were both working for uh, Vanity Fair, so... Uh, that's how they met. Now, here are two portraits that Murray did of her. They are called gelatin silver prints. Artists who took their, uh, I mean, that is to say, photographers who took their work seriously still do much of their work in black and white and also use the gelatin, gelatin silver prints, the use of a gelatin emulsion and on a, on a silver plate and for clarity and sharpness. You can get many, many nuances of from black to gray with a gelatin silver print. You can, you can really manipulate the, uh, the, the tonalities within, within, that, uh, uh, within that range. Frida loved these pictures. She said, you will always be inside the magenta rebozo on the left side, meaning her, her heart. And she also remembered their breakfast at the Barbizon Plaza Hotel drugstore. The Barbizon Plaza is no more. I think it was destroyed in the 1970s. But I remember the Barbizon Plaza because they had a wonderful disco. And we would go, I would go with friends to the discos in New York. And my favorite one was the Barbizon Plaza, okay? So uh, that, that's a wonderful memory for me. Uh, you know, I wouldn't go to the discos in New Jersey. Uh-uh-uh, not for me. I went to the discos in New York. Okay, now here are two other portraits that M M M Murray did. The Dietrich portrait, the Marlena Dietrich, was from the 1940s. The Marilyn Monroe one was in 1952, the year she, and then the following year, she would do Di Niagara with um, Joseph Cotton. And that is an absolutely fabulous movie. It really is. And um, she, again, she played the usual bombshell, but she was very, very good in that movie indeed. Now, Murray also photographed Babe Ruth, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and Humphrey Bogart. These gelatin, gelatin silver prints are for sale on the Murray website. And I'm going to show you another Murray. This is their, his self-portrait with Frida, and there is on the, um, this is from 1941, and on the uh, 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 easel is a portrait 
a self-portrait that she's doing of herself. Now, this is the one time I see her. She's wearing a Mexican blouse, but she's also wearing a pair of slacks, which also would have probably hidden the, the, the problem with, with the leg. So I, that's the only time I really see her in any kind of, a, a, shall we say, contemporary clothing. Now, uh, the two pictured are pictured with her self-portrait in 1941. Now, in 1939, Frida left for Paris for an exhibition there with, uh, of her work by André Breton. Now, remember, she exhibited, exhibited in New York in 1938. 1939, she goes to Paris, and we know in 1940s, the Nazis walked, marched in, okay? We know that. All right, we know that is our timeline. Now, she went to Paris, but there was total chaos with this particular exhibition. First of all, the works were being held in customs, and the customs people in France wouldn't give the paintings out. The gallery was not yet selected. Marshal Duchamp, who was a surrealist, was helping to organize the exhibition, and Breton wrote the intro to the exhibition catalog. So, she hated Paris. She wrote steamy love letters to Muray, called the surrealist, quote, this is my, her quote, her saying it, not me, cuckoo lunatic sons of bitches, quote, unquote, and she was desperate to leave France. By February, she was in the American hospital there with an E. coli infection that had shut down her kidneys. And she said of this, quote, I felt like I was going to explode any minute, unquote. She must have been in horrible pain, poor soul. She was sure she caught it at Breton's house, eating something that wasn't cleaned. She thought that Parisians were dirty and that they ate strange food. But she went to the nightclubs and shopped, buying two dolls at a flea market and asked Mireille to think of two Hungarian names for the dolls. The self-portrait that you, uh, that you um, saw was painted during the love affair with Murray. And here's another one of the self-portrait painted while she was with Murray in 1939. It's called The Frame. Now, this is a work ex executed on metal, all right? The border was done on a piece of glass, then placed over the portrait. So it's, it's actually paint, metal, probably a, a piece of a, a sheet metal, steel probably, maybe aluminum, and over that was a piece of metal. Now, the bright colors again and the flowers evoke Mexican folk art, and they look like the paper flowers sold in the markets there, and I'm sure they still sell those paper flowers. She looks very well with the starry skies behind her and the yellow flowers setting off her dark features. It was well received, and the Louvre bought this work which is now at the Pompidou Museum. So there she was in 1938, and the Louvre is buying her work, Edward G. Robinson is buying her work, and soon, soon one of her paintings would land up at the um, uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York, okay? Now, this is the portrait of the, that, that was on the easel, the self-portrait with parrots. As I told you, she had many pets and did many self-portraits with her pets. The birds have the same straightforward stare that is the hallmark of her self-portraits. The parrots can allude symbolically to purity and innocence, but also to inane chatter. They sit comfortably and at ease with her. The animals, um, she never had any problems with animals, okay? She may have had problems with her husband, but not with the animals. Okay. Now we're going to step back a little bit to another painting, which is called What the Water Gave Me in 1938. This, in a way, is a surrealist work because it's a lot of disparate things, all right, and that one must puzzle out. Uh, she is in the water, which is a life giver, all right. She's in the bathtub, and you can see her reflected, the, the two feet look like crabs, or crab-like, and the broken, the broken right toe bleeds. She floats in the water with one of her dresses floating in the water, okay, alluding to her, to her uh, heritage, while her parents appear behind the seaweed fronds. The wire is, there is a wire held by a, by a, tr a trunk-clad man, is wound around, her, around the, her neck and fastened to an outcropping while the dead birds, to, to a dead bird, while insects and caterpillars inch on the wire. Now you have to look very close to see, to see this, okay? 
So I'm going to leave it there for a moment or so. Now, on the right, you will see a volcano gushing. But in the middle of the volcano is a skyscraper looking very, very much like the Empire State Building. So very, very incongruous things all put together, but they refer, of course, to her time in, in, in America. The gushing fountain on the left suggests refreshment and possible baptism. <clears throat> Lastly are two nudes floating on a clod of earth with roots that reach into the water. The next painting I'm going to show you is very, very similar to what you're seeing right there with the two nude women on the floating on the, on the little island. All these depictions are tied to her life, her background, and her hopes. Now, this was at the New York exhibi exhibi exhibit of 1938, and it was bought by Murray. Now, here is the next painting that is related to this one. It's called Two Nudes in the Forest from 1939. The two figures from the previous work became a work that Kahlo gave to Dolores Del Rio, with whom she was fr a friend. Now, there were also suggestions that there was a lesbian relationship with them. I do not know, but it has been suggested, all right? Seated before a tangle of vines, plants, and gnarled wood, spied upon by two monkeys. Now, monkeys in a painting, you, many times you will see, even in, in Baroque and Renaissance paintings, you will see uh, still lifes, let's say, you will see a monkey. Monkeys are indicative of many things. They are symbols of lust, but they are also indicative of evil and also of mischief. Because, you know, monkeys do a lot of mischief. You, lead a, you let a monkey uh, in your house, and, and in no time at all, they will have destroyed one or more of your rooms, okay? Now, um, there is a homoerotic overtone to this painting. The cut there was also a cutaway view of the roots while the women sit in quiet reverie. In other words, roots. She is always talking about being rooted. And maybe one of the thing is when you are rooted, you cannot move. And that may be another reason why she uses those roots. My roots are in Mexico and I am rooted there and I cannot move because of her difficulty in moving. By the way, she also had serious back issues that was related to her accident, the accident that she had when she was a teenager. Now, the next one is called The Suicide of Dorothy Hale. Claire Booth Luce, as I told you, was at that time the editor in the 1930s, early 40s. Uh, she was the editor of Vanity Fair magazine. And as a result, when you're an editor of a, of a New York magazine like that, you, you, you travel in intellectual circles. You travel in circles with celebrities and whatnot. And... Um, Claire Booth Luce ordered this painting. She knew Frida, obviously through, through, obviously through Murray, or from going to the exhibition in 1938, I'm sure, she, I'm sure she did go to that exhibition. Um, so Claire Booth Luce asked Frida to please do this portrait of her friend who had died, because she was going to give the portrait to the, to the mother, to, to the um, uh, Claire Hale, um, um, Miss, Miss, Hale's, um, Miss Hale's mother, Dorothy Hale's mother. So, Hale was a socialite in New York who jumped from her apartment at the Hampshire House in New York in October 1938 after giving a cocktail party. She had all her friends come in. She had a black dress on with a rose. And when they left, she jumped out, jumped out the window. Her artist husband had been killed in an accident a few years before. She was supported by friends, including Luce, who gave her money for her rent. She, she had no way to make a living. She hoped for a job at the New York World's Fair. She had hoping when the World's Fair came, she would get some kind of a job as a hostess or whatever. Bernard Baruch, the industrialist, told her to get a husband. He gave her $1,000 to buy a dress and do the rounds of society parties so that she might meet someone and marry. 
She called Luce to come to, a co to the cocktail party she was giving before taking what she said was going to be a long journey. Luce refused, but told her to wear her black velvet gown. And the rose corsage she wore was sent by the, by the, um, sculptor, uh, the um, sculptor Osamu Noguchi. All right, N Noguchi did some of the reliefs on the uh, on the Rockefeller uh, uh, the Rockefeller um, uh, Center. Okay, so uh, Osamu Noguchi obviously knew Diego Rivera, and he knew Claire Booth Luce, and he and it was he traveled in the same circle as Frida, which would travel in. Now. Kahlo pictures her fall and her broken body spread out on the canvas and surrounding the frame as well uh, with a shadow, okay, with a shadow on the frame cast by the foot which is hanging below the, below the picture. The narrative is told in a very straightforward manner. Now, Glare Booth Luce, when she saw this, was shocked. She wanted a portrait of her to give to the girl's mother, but how could she possibly give this to the girl's mother, to Dorothy Hale's mother? Not only that, on the bottom, it was, her name was painted in. So she was absolutely appalled by this. At one point, she thought of destroying the painting. Meanwhile, the, the, her name was painted out of the banner, all right? She wanted to destroy the painting, but she decided that she would give it to a museum. She gave it to the Phoenix Museum of Art in Phoenix, Arizona, all right? And this is a, a New, York girl, New York socialite in Phoenix, Arizona. So she gave it to the Phoenix Museum with a promise of an anonymity, but that was revealed accidentally, and she said, Claire Booth Lou said, no good deed goes unpunished, and that's true, okay? So everyone knew that Claire Booth Luce had, had commissioned the painting from Frida. Now here's the next one. The, the self-portrait with a thorn necklace and a hummingbird from 1940. The thorn necklace, of course, refers to uh, uh, the, the suffering of Christ with the, with the crown of thorns. And the... the the necklace is being tightened by a monkey as her neck begins to bleed. She stares out at us with a very hypnotic, stoical expression as the cat sits menacingly on her shoulder with a hypnotic stare. Now, cats also are believed to be symbols of evil, all right? Um, Edward Manet, the uh, realist artist of the 19th century, used black cats in many of his paintings. The black cats that look out very, very directly at us. It was almost like his alter ego, okay? Now, the hummingbird is considered a magic love charm in Mexico. That I didn't know. Hummingbirds and butterflies were also resurrection symbols in pre-Columbian Mexico. And the suffering here we see is cathartic. Now, many, um, Frida was visited often by people from Hollywood, including Eddie Albert. And Eddie Albert's wife wrote of Frida. She was quick, she was a quick mind and swift movements. She could always come up with a, with a, with a, with a, a really zinger quote or a zinger comment on something, okay? And she's really, really, a very, very bright lady indeed, very, very much so. Now, this next one is the dream, and again, it looks like it's floating. Kahlo's art, as I've told you, was intensely personal and introspective. Here she is in her sickbed, which floats above the clouds. Now, by the 1940s, she was having a lot of problems, not only with the leg, but with her back as well, okay? So she was, un again, still undergoing operations. Now, um, above the bed, we see her shattered skeleton. The leg has 11 breaks and is being held together with wires that also look like sticks of TNT for some reason, like it's going to explode any minute, okay? The ivy-like tendrils grow on her bed and are obviously ready to envelop her, but she is powerless to stop it obvious reference to her pain and to having 32 operations after the accident in 1925. In 1953, 
her right leg was finally amputated. After having performed many operations, they had to amputate it. Her last diary entry reads, quote, I hope the leaving is joyful and I hope never to return, unquote. Now, by the, uh, by the 1950s, she was back in Mexico. Her, her leg was amputated in 1953. And after that, they had a, uh, an exhibit of her work. She was taken, she, well, she was in bed. She couldn't move. So they picked up the bed and they took her to the exhibit so that she could be around her friends. Uh, now, if you've seen the movie Frida, you know they show the beginning of the movie is where she is in the bed and they're taking her in the truck. They put her in a truck and the truck goes bouncing down the road, which of course must have caused her really an awful lot of pain. So anyway, um, you should watch the movie Frida. It's based upon the book of her life and uh, the, uh, a very, very good biography that was written a number of, year, a number of years ago. And it was, the movie was directed by Julie Tremor, who also directed the, Sp uh, the Spider-Man um, Broadway, Broadway, on Broadway. She was a woman director and she directed that particular movie. So I would advise you to see it because it's, it's a very good movie indeed. Now, so let's go to the next. The Broken Column, an agonizing, tortured, tortured portrait of a woman in perpetual pain. The column is an icon iconic column with her chin resting on the capital. She sews her spine cobbled together in the metal techniques, med med medical techniques of the 1920s. Now, medicine has changed exponentially from the 1920s, okay? So they might have been be able to repair her, repair, repair her body today, but in the 1920s, it was, well, kind of hit or miss, all right? You took your chances. Now, this image is replete with nails, which may refer to crucifixion. Notice her whole body is riddled with nails. The tears flow, but her face is very stoical. And the black, the bleak desert landscape reflects her lack of hope. In fact, the next painting is called Without Hope. She, she wrote here in her diary, not the least hope remains to me. Everything moves in time with what the belly contains. After her numerous operations, Frida became very emaciated and was being fed pureed food every two hours. She was also on an awful lot of meds, a lot of pain meds, all right, and which occasionally she would take the, the pain med with a um, alcohol, okay? Now, the bleak, again, the bleak landscape, there it is, and there's this huge machine above her. It's, it's almost like a Rube Goldberg presentation, but the sun is there. She's got the sun in the corner, okay? And um, refers to the bleak landscape and also this Rube Goldberg-like device that's feeding her uh, ref is reflective of her physical and psychological outlook. The sugar skull on top is the object Mexicans leave at the graves of their deads on All Souls Day, November the 1st. They also buy sugar skeletons as a treat there is a morbid interest in death in Mexico, okay? So that's the only way I can explain it. Now, here is her self-portrait with monkeys. She said of these paintings, I paint self-portraits because I am so often alone, because I am the subject I know best, unquote. Diego had given her a pet monkey, which again, I told you, a symbol of mischief and evil. But the monkey's, the monkey's tails and arms twine about her. But in the back, there is a bird of paradise plant, a foliage that creates a ruffle-like pattern, characteristic of Frida that also cut off any recession into space, all right? All of her paintings, as I've told you, are very flat. And thus forcing the onlooker to concentrate on her face. She was endlessly inventive with her self-portraits. Just as, you know what I would compare her to? I would compare her to Rembrandt. Rembrandt did over 33 self-portraits over the time of his life, including a lot of drawings. I'm not even talking about the drawings, I'm just talking about the self-portraits. And he was endlessly inventive with, with them, and I would say she is equally so, equally in, as inventive with her self-portraits. 
<clears throat> All right, now let's, let's look at the next one. This is an interesting one. It's called Diego on my mind. Now here she is wearing, spidery roots emerge from her head and there were on her forehead there was a portrait of Diego. It shows her preoccupation with him. And she wrote of him, I have suffered two great accidents in my life. One in which a streetcar ran me over, the other is Diego. She's wearing the native dress, and that was unquote. She's wearing the native dress of Tijuana, a woman from the, the, the Tehuantepec Peninsula. Diego liked her in Mexican dress, okay? Though she portrays herself with Diego, this did not prevent herself from having affairs. She once said, and this is another quote, not me, she's speaking, I drink to drown my sorrows, but the son of a bitches have learned how to swim. Unquote. Very, very, really on target. That's an on target quote if there ever was one, okay? Thinking about death. Yes, yeah, she spent a lot of time thinking about it. A skull replaces Diego's face. This is the, both done in 1943, but a skull replaces Diego's face. And it shows the Mexican preoccupation and her preoccupation with death and suffering that can be seen in their churches with statues and paintings of figures with blood dripping and unimaginable suffering. Now, in Mexico, there is a shrine called the Virgin of Guadalupe. And any of you who have been to Mexico, and I'm sure many of you have, know that the Mexicans approach this shrine from afar on their knees, inching forward. Okay, you don't walk up, you, you get on your knees and you walk on your knees, so it takes like maybe a half an hour to walk that long distance uh, along the, um, the uh, courtyard to the church and then go into the church, all right? Now here's another one. This is called Flower of Life. And it's a lustful, er erotic rendition of a flower whose tentacles resemble fallopian tubes, don't they? With predatory claws. The center has a network of blood vessels alluding to a womb surrounded by red kettles. The lobster red co coloring, the blazing red sun and the flash of lightning is this is no doubt one of the most original still lifes of sexuality and fertility. It's just practically bursting off the canvas. It is repellent, and it is repellent. There, there are certain elements of this which are quite repellent, but it, oh, you are also attracted by this explosion of color, these explosion of shapes on that canvas. So that it can be, a painting can be that way. It can be something you stare at, but it's also very repellent. Well, think about when you go to a movie, a, a scary movie, when you were a kid, all right? You went to the scary movie. When the scary parts came, you hid your head. You hid your face, you, 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 you put your hands up to your eyes, but you still peeked, right? You take a peek, but you, but you put your hands, put your hands on your eyes again, okay? So that, this, this is, uh, I would, I would uh, in a way, compare it to that particular experience. Now this one is called Diego and Frida. And this one goes from 1929 to 1944. They divorced, as you know, in January of 1940 by mutual agreement, but they remarried again on December 8, 1940, the same year they remarried again in San Francisco, by the way. They continued to have separate residences even after their remarriage. During their marriage, they had houses next to each other with a bridge connecting them. This dual portrait, now notice the faces are not perfectly aligned because it shows their differences, all right, but they are also bound by a shell resembling a heart. Two people, one heart. They are also bound together by branches resembling arteries. The Mexican sun on the right and the moon, no, I'm sorry, the, the sun and the moon on the left, all right, are, um, the moon on the right are also there. Dualities representing their, represent their culture and the rays of the sun look very much like Sputnik, does it not? Which, which of course, Sputnik was not to come until 1957. 
Now, here is another. This, this particular picture is very difficult to explain. It's called Moses from 1945. She tries to explain Moses and monotheism, and she says, quote, I must confess to you that I find this painting very incomplete and rather different from what the interpretation should be of what Freud analyzes so marvelously in his Moses. In other words, she was reading Freud. Okay, now back to her quote. But I generalized in my way, a very confused way, the deeds or images that impressed me the most as I read the book, as I read the book, okay. So she's saying, I'm I did this very, I'm very, very, very conf confused. Now, she was reading Freud analysis, okay, and this is conceived as a, as a, mural, as a mural central area. The, in the middle is the conception of conception and birth with the blazing sun above it and the ray that ends with hands and droplets of falling water. Now on the upper left are the gods and figures of uh, the symbols of Aztec and pre-Columbian culture with the ever-present skeleton. On the right, however, are Christian symbols. Thus we see a three-faced Christ, the Virgin Mary, Egyptian Horus, the god of Egypt, the Greek sculpt uh, Apollo, uh, and also Venus on a shell, and the devil as well. Now in the middle, in the middle, in the middle ground, on the left and on the right, you see figures uh, from Egypt, Nefertiti, you see Karl Marx, Mohandas Gandhi, Buddha, and Stalin on the left. But on the right, you see um, herself, Frida Kahlo, self-portrait, Christ with thorns, Saladin, the, uh, the, uh, the Arab uh, leader, Martin Luther, Napoleon, and Hitler. She even put Hitler in this painting. And it was done in 19, well, 1945. And uh, she put Hitler in the painting, and on the opposite side is Stalin, okay? Now, and the bottom left, Man is the constructor. Man, man the constructor is biracial. Behind him there are a massing of people under a banner. And that's on the bottom left. On the bottom right, we see a biracial mother nursing her child, a monkey with a massing of people, the downtrodden masses, as the communists like to say. All these figures emerge from the earth and the ancient tree trunks that serve to separate the works into three segments. So you've got to look real closely, and even she said she generalized in my way a very confused way because she was reading Freud and she wanted to translate what she was reading with him, which Freud wrote a treatise on Moses and obviously went in every which direction, okay? And uh, she wanted to reinterpret that as, as a painting. The next painting is called The Tree of Hope. By nine, this is from 1946, but by 1944, the pain in her foot and in her spine was increasing. She lost weight, had fainting spells, she could not sit or stand. An operation was suggested, and she began wearing a steel corset, 28 of them in all, okay, because each one was less comfortable than the other, and they were actually steel corsets that would, shall we say, support her spine, but did nothing but give her a lot of pain. Now, Frida, as you can see here, is holding a corset and wearing another one. The cracks refer to her bleeding spine. Her sign says, quote, the tree of hope keeps me firm, unquote. She is also wired with terminals that look like the ones that are used in an EKG for your heart. In 1946, she came to New York City to the hospital for special surgery and had four of her vertebrae fused with a bone from her pelvis. Now, she didn't have too many bones that were in one piece in the first place, okay? And uh, when she was in Mexico, she was very reluctant to come for the surgery, but the pain after a while was something she could not bear, and she had to take the trip from Mexico, and I, it probably was a train trip. I don't imagine it would be, it was an airplane trip, probably a train trip, uh, 
into Texas and then from there or California and then from there going east, I don't know, but I doubt it was if it was an airplane ride. Um, so she went to the hospital for special surgery with the idea that something could be done for her. And of course she came to the United States because there was, this was, this may have been very, very experimental at the time. I know they do it now, but it may have been very, very experimental at that time. Now, the next one is The Little Deer, also from 1946. Frida kept her fawn in her house, and here she is the deer, the little fawn, running through a bleak forest. Notice the forest has filled with trees with no, nothing, no, no vegetation, no leaves, whatever. And, and she, though she is shot through with arrows, she is still ambulatory, running away from the pain, and her, which is her enemy, of course. She shows her conquest of pain and suffering. That is perhaps the only way she could deal with it. She was, however, according to her friend, according to her friends, a joyful person, happy with friends in her work, always had a smile on her face when the friends came. And of course, there was this banter that would go on. I mean, she was really, really clever with cocktail conversation and banter of that sort. Now, let's look at this one. Wait a minute, now I want to show you, wait a minute. Oops, wait, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to this one, okay? This is called The Love Embrace of the Universe. The Earth, Diego, Me, and Mr. Schottel from 1949. Now here is another one of these dream works with a very surreal quality. I, when I saw the title, I said, Mr. Schottel, who is Mr. Schottel? It must be someone, I said, in Aztec, mythology. And sure enough, there was a figure in Aztec mythology. Let me tell you about him. Mr. Schotel is a reference to the Atlas Aztec god of lightning, who according to myth was dogged by misfortune. One of her dogs, by the way, one of Frida's dogs was named Schotel. Now, D Mr. Schotel's feet are turned backwards, so he finds it hard to know where he is going, an oblique reference to her leg and foot, which, was, which were crushed in the accident. So here we have a combination of her personal experience and the culture from which she came. Now, Frida herself is sitting in the center of the painting. Notice the sun and the moon are there. Again, the dualities. And she is holding... Um, she is holding Diego, who is a baby in her lap, and who has been blessed by a third eye in the middle of his forward, uh, forehead, the all-seeing eye of the artist. They are embraced by the Mother Earth figure whose hands and arm have roots extending downward. Notice the arms that are embracing her and Diego. Behind them is the... Um, there are sun-like discs in the upper left and right allude to the Aztec sun calendar, and behind the earth figure is the Aztec head and Mr. Schotel, that is Mr. Schotel, okay? So, again, she uses the mythology to explain why she, and this, we know why this person is in the painting. Now I'm going to back up. This is one of her last paintings, done in 1954. It's in a private collection right now. It's called Long Live Life, and right on the front of the watermelon, it says, Viva la Vida, carved on the melon, Long Live Life. It is a still life of rich, ripe fruits done with lush colors. And Viva la Vida is carved right smack dab in the middle. The melon in the left background looks very much like, has, has a sun-like appearance, which we see in her other paintings. The fruits, however, are flat and rigid, uh, but they ex exude a lush life with their juiciness and seeds. F the fruits are ripe while she is not fruitful. She wrote at this time, I am not sick, I am broken, but I am happy as long as I can paint. This was her last diary entry. The work was finished eight days before she died on Janu July 13, 1954. Her leg had been, as I told you, uh, amputated the year before, and she remained an invalid in terrible pain, lessened by massive doses of pain medication, and as I mentioned, sometimes alcohol. I'd like to thank you so much for joining me in this uh, visit and this, this um, 
reliving of the life of Frida Kahlo, I do suggest that you see the movie Frida Kahlo because it is absolutely wonderful. You might possibly catch it on Netflix, okay? So I would suggest you do it because it will give you an awful lot of information and is very, very, uh, shall we say, truthful and very, um, very much kept e in keeping with what her life was like. It, it's not, it's not uh, fictionalized. It is a true telling of what her life was. Thank you very much and uh, have a very nice, by nice fall and a very nice winter and happy holidays to all of you. Um, things will get better, believe me they will. Okay, bye-bye.